everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. This is Jill Hurston, Marketing at CenterZip. I just want to remind everybody that this session is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be available on our website by tomorrow at this time. I will send you an email with the direct link to the site so you can easily find it. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to introduce Stephen Mason. He is our VP of Engineering who will be moderating today's session. Stephen, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jill. Uh, today we have uh, a webinar with Colin Jones. Uh, Colin is a ten year, has 10 years of technology experience uh, developing web applications and mobile apps. He's currently the CTO at 8Flight, uh, which is a software development firm focused on growing developers uh, through their apprenticeship program. Good morning, Colin. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for the kind introduction, and thanks to Centers for having me today. Um, so, I, yeah, as Steve said, I'm Colin Jones, CTO at 8 Light, and today I'd like to really highlight some of the underestimated costs of microservice architectures. So I suspect most of you are familiar with the idea of microservices. I'm not going to be giving any kind of rigorous definition here, but generally we're talking about small autonomous services with some clearly defined API. And if you've heard about microservices, which I, I'm sure many of you have since you're joining here today, you've probably seen some of these stories of just pure, unmitigated awesomeness out in, out in the tech media. And less frequently, you may also have seen some of the sadder stories um, around microservices. And you may have some expectation coming into this talk about where I'm going to concentrate and whether the microservices architectures I've seen and the ones that 8th Light has seen are more happy or sad stories. Um, but yeah, you might wonder, when I talk about costs, am I trying to convince you to abandon microservices as an architectural tool? And the answer, spoiler alert, is no. I'm not going to try to convince you that microservices are bad or that you shouldn't use them. Um, we've definitely seen many of the benefits in action directly at 8th Light across a good number of client projects. So if your experience, if your company's experience, if your prior ex company's experiences with microservices has been great, I, I do believe you and I respect that experience and I'm happy about that. Uh, but I do want to present uh, a, a bit of the flip side. The emphasis here is mine. And this quote is from Martin Fowler's fantastic web-based microservices resource guide. And I'll, I'll say now there, there are going to be links at the end for all the resources I mentioned. Um, and and they'll, be, they'll be online, as, as Jill said, um, on the CenterZip website. And I've linked the slides on my Twitter as well. Um, so no need to try and record all the references. But wow, you know, for this, this quote, how, how can this be, Martin Fowler? Why are microservices such a hot topic with so many advocates if we should usually not use them? Um, so my view, my take, is that our industry is in a bunch of different places. Right? This is the Gartner Hype Cycle graph, and usually we understand this graph as, as being the entire industry with the x-axis being time and maybe specific years or months and the understanding of maybe the leading edge of our industry, your Amazons, Netflixes, your Googles. But I think it's also useful to view this hype cycle in terms of each of our personal journeys with a given piece of technology. Um, so at, at the same time, Google, Netflix, Amazon are out here on the plateau of productivity. My 20-person or smaller e-commerce shop might be at the peak of inflated expectations or the, the trough of disillusionment. Um, so I, you know, I, I'd like to think personally that I'm somewhere along the slope of enlightenment, maybe, but it, you know, it's hard to say except in hindsight um, and, and looking back over, over your emotional journey uh, with a given piece of technology. Incidentally, n nobody, I'd, I haven't, I've yet to meet anybody who self-identifies at the peak of inflated expectations, right? You only find that out after it comes crashing down around you. So to be clear, I, I don't think that experts out there are hiding the truth or being disingenuous about microservices. I've heard and read Sam Newman, Martin Fowler, many others um, in this area um, explicitly outlining costs and talking about downsides. Martin Fowler has a whole blog post specifically focused on the downsides. And, and yet, I think as technologists, we, we hear what we want to hear. It's, it's easy to get to that peak of inflated expectations where you know, we're searching for new ways to make our gnarly code bases manageable. Um, these messages can look pretty compelling, these, these, these benefits messages. And the costs definitely aren't clear to everyone adopting these architectures. They aren't obvious to many of our clients until they start having to pay for the costs, and they weren't obvious to me, certainly before I was working in a microservices world. So what, what I want to do today is to emphasize the costs, without downplaying the benefits, but emphasize the costs. Um, but before I do so, I, it, you know, again, my message isn't about avoiding microservices entirely, so I do want to balance by saying you know, I do understand and acknowledge the upsides, and, and I, I want to kind of just start by reviewing many of the benefits that microservices 
can provide to an architecture. So this won't be a complete list of the benefits, but these are some of the biggest wins that I've observed. Okay, so independent deployability, big benefit, right? The sign-up team can now deploy without having to consult the order fulfillment team and work out their code um, coordination. So coordination goes down, risk goes down, deployment size goes down, and the speed of innovation hopefully goes up, right? This is great. Um, independent scalability, the ability to scale only our bottlenecks, only, you know, if we have a part of our system that needs to grow, one specific piece um, that's a bottleneck, we can just scale up the bits in with microservices. We can just scale up those bits that are associated with that process and leave our spending and our, our operational uh, effort where it is for all the non-bottleneck pieces, right? So this independent scalability property is, is nice. Fault tolerance. Um, so if, if you imagine you have a recommendation engine team that ships a bug and crashes the their process, um, we as consumers of the entire application or some web app or something might still be able to see the full product catalog and make purchases if we don't consume that recommendation engine team's feature, um, if, we can, if we're consuming that over the network rather than in process, right? A, f a fault can crash a process versus being able to, to have a timeout or any, any number of other patterns around fault tolerance um, from a remote process. Um, in a monolith, all, all the features are tied up in the same runtime, which means everybody's locked into the same versions of dependencies. So there, there are some exceptions here, um, OSGI and others, sort of fancy plug-in architectures. Um, but you know, in, in, by and large, if you have a widely used dependency across your monolith, like a, a web framework or an ORM, it can be a really major dedicated effort to upgrade, even for something as critical as security patches. Um, with microservices, on the other hand, we can upgrade our dependencies incrementally, one service at a time, and, and again, the risk goes down for each, each one of those deployments, and it's a lot easier to get those things out the door versus having to do one big bang um, sort, of, sort of migration. Uh, so microservices provide, you know, by definition, these explicit enforced boundaries. Nobody can reach across the network into a service's internals um, to, to make a method call or, or they can't change a private method to make it public. The API is the boundary, whether that's HTTP or a message bus or what have you. What's behind on the other side of that boundary is fully encapsulated and the team that, that owns the service is free to change the internals. So that team inside the boundary really, really owns their fate. They can do whatever big refactorings, even rewrites of their service that they want. They can use, if they want, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, if the organization is behind it, they can use a totally different language from the other teams, et cetera. Um, all kinds of other tool decisions they can make independently. And the organization as a whole also, because we've got this idea of small t a small team owning a service, the organization as a whole can grow by defining new business processes in terms of, of new services and then hiring a, uh, up for that service team, um, some cross-functional group. Um, so with, with smaller pieces that we can rewrite quickly, you know, the, people vary in their opinions. Um, you know, two weeks is one definition I've heard that you can rewrite a microservice in, um, but you know, in many organizations it, it could take much longer. Um, but at any rate, we have smaller pieces than a monolith. And when we have small pieces, we can get closer to greenfield development or you know, modern practices and tools more often and make our code easier to understand. So loading the whole code base into our heads becomes a tractable, tractable problem, which hopefully ends up meaning fewer bugs, more flexible design, all kinds of other good things. Um, and I think really, in, 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 in my experience, in the long tail of development organizations, so not, not your big, big codes that are, that are out on the edge like Netflix and Google, and certainly for many of our clients who come to us looking for microservices help specifically, this is a really big one. This is an important one. Okay, so yeah, this is great. There's lots of, lots of benefits here. Um, now, let's get into the costs. So this isn't going to be an exhaustive list of the costs either. Um, and I want to point out ahead of time that none of the costs I'm going to talk about today do I feel are blockers in, in, by any means. So for each one of these costs, we're going to look briefly at some mitigations or ways to pay for these costs. But we won't have time to talk deeply about most of the mitigations. There's a lot there, a lot to think about, a lot to understand, and a lot to actually implement. So uh, you know, for any given problem, there's, there's going to be multiple possible solutions. And I'll have a slide for each cost with some of the possibilities that you can refer back to um, you know, at, at a later time to help kind of jumpstart your research into how to pay for these specific things. So before we talk about the underestimated cost, I want to talk about 
what costs are, do I feel are well understood in the industry? Um, so first, latency. Function call overhead in a monolith is almost nothing, maybe even literally nothing due to um, compiler inlining or other fanciness. Um, but the network round trip we, we introduced with a microservice call um, could be a millisecond, could be tens, hundreds of milliseconds, depending on, on the network, on the service capabilities, what it's actually responsible for and doing. Um, so definitely there's, there's an increase, definitely an increase in latency by introducing microservices. Um, and, and we can mitigate that, right? We can cache responses locally as on the client side to avoid paying for that network uh, traversal. Or we can batch our calls up, send 100 IDs in one call versus making 100 separate calls for one ID each. Or, or we can keep our services fairly coarse and, and wide so that not many calls are necessary um, in general. So, you know, I, I found this, this latency cost and the potential mitigations even to be mostly well-known or even for, for some folks who've been around a while, even, even maybe intuitive um, among software developers. So additional infrastructure is another one that I, I feel like is, is on the tip of folks' tongues when, when we talk about microservices trade-offs. So if we have N services, that implies that we have at least N pieces of infrastructure to manage and pay for, probably many more, you know, databases and caches and queues and, and, and you know, multiple instances of, of application servers, et cetera. But, you know, having more parts, um, more parts of infrastructure has, has a bunch of implications that we'll get into in the remainder of the talk. But here for this additional infrastructure, well understood cost, I'm, I'm thinking about the pure base cost of maintaining that infrastructure. So, you know, how much, how much do you pay for servers? How much do you pay, you know, somebody to, to get the thing set up, um, patches, um, hopefully there's infrastructure automation and other things um, that we'll talk through. And in fact, infrastructure automation is, is one, of the, one of the mitigations here. Um, the idea of keeping maintenance and startup costs down, you, we can use tools like Terraform, Chef Puppet, Ansible, CloudFormation um, to, to manage our infrastructure and, and configuration. We can use virtual machines in the cloud um, to be able to get servers going quickly. We can keep our direct spending down with containers, pack a few small services onto a host, um, and then auto-scaling serverless um, are, are techniques that are, are great for a lot of things, but one of them is the idea of paying for only what you use with auto-scaling. Um, so these kinds of tools um, on, on the slide, these, these mitigations, are, are pretty game-changing, and having these around is, is a pretty big, um, pretty big uh, enabler for microservices. They're, they're becoming the norm in the industry for sure, so for, for many teams, these might not even feel like costs that need to be paid. On the other hand, not, not every team is here yet, right? So, so people are in different places in, in, their, in their technology journeys, um, and, and the shift in mindset um, to this world, the learning required to operate these, these technologies, even in a minimal way, is, is not free, right? You, you, can, you can accomplish it via you know, paying some extra salary in, in the hiring process, et cetera, but um, they're not free. And, and, and I want to pause really and, and highlight, highlight that again um, before we go into the underestimated costs. I, I think, you know, as we're talking about costs, understanding what the mitigations are, understanding how it is that we pay for something is not the actual act of paying, right? It's, it's, it's critical. We, we, there's, there's no way around it. It's a dependency. We have to understand how to pay before we can pay, but it doesn't get us all the way there. Um, so we do this every day. If we, if we want to eat dinner tonight, you know, th there are costs that we'll, we'll have to pay. Most of us pretty much understand how to make dinner happen, right? We, oh, you just, you just go to the restaurant or you just, you know, go to the grocery store and, and cook it up. But that, that, doesn't make, that doesn't make it cost free, right? And our mitigations, likewise, that, that we're, we're talking about, likewise need to be paid for. Um, so understanding how to mitigate is an important step, but it's not all the way there. It might, it, yeah. So, um, you know, for, for the two costs that we've talked about so far, we fairly immediately experience them as we're getting started down this path. So I, I think they're expected by pretty much every team adopting this style. But of course, there are a lot more costs that most of us, I think, and I've observed, do underestimate before we get fairly deep into it. And again, I'm not excluding myself from the people who underestimate these things. This is, I've drastically underestimated these things in the past, and I probably still continue to do so. Okay, data consistency. So I, I think we, as an industry, are, are not great at data consistency already in three-tier architectures, right? The very simple uh, sort of, uh, sort of three-tier architecture setup. I'll, I'll be the first to admit, transaction isolation levels are not intuitive to me. I, I have to relearn them from time to time about what all the different anomalies that can happen are, um, and, 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 and it's not trivial. 
Microservice architectures only exacerbate this type, this type of, of misunderstanding. So one option when we extract a new microservice is to share a database. Uh, but if we go this route, we lose a lot of the independence benefits that we're looking for because the services are still tightly coupled through this database schema. I've seen plenty of companies doing this, and by and large, they're experiencing the same pains that they were trying to avoid by adopting microservices. I don't recommend this. I've heard people call this an anti-pattern. Um, so typically, what we prefer to do is we prefer to give each service its own, its own data store. And, and this, this causes some questions to arise, um, or namely, so can we completely partition the data across all our services so that no two services have the same or similar data? And if, if, if we do that, how do we, how do we avoid the entity service anti-pattern that Michael Nygaard writes about? And how do we, how do we make these, um, this, denorm, this sorry, normalization uh, perform really well? Um, and, and, and so the flip side, if we can't partition the data perfectly, if there is similar data across services, how do we keep that data in sync across multiple databases? Or do we allow that data to, to drift a little bit? Um, and if so, you know, what local data to a given service can, can we trust? So th there's a lot of data consistency problems to wrangle with. Eventual consistency is really the way of the world um, with microservices. Um, you know, we might have... Um, uh, a canonical source of truth for any given piece of information and, and derived data. We might have back-end sync processes. Um, and there's, there's a whole other, other question around business analytics. These, these folks might want an overall view of the data across the system, and getting that overall view can be hard. You know, we might have a co-owned ETL process, or maybe they use logs or, or some, you know, subscribe to some service bus that has all, all the information as it flows through the system. Um, but at, at any rate, no, these are all pretty, pretty fundamental, large architectural questions and, and also tactical questions that, that need to be solved. Um, this book can help a lot in understanding how to pay the costs. And aside from very clear explanations of these, these tricky problems, it has by far, yeah, I, I would say by far, it has the best bibliography of any book I've ever read. Definitely recommend it. It's not an easy read, but it's essential to what many of us do in shuffling data around among services and transforming it. Okay, that was data consistency. With microservices, we're also, we're also really forced into planning for failure because it, failure is the norm rather than the exception in this world. Um, this is another angle on fault tolerance, right? We talked about fault tolerance as a positive. In this angle, uh, you know, we, we, have to, we have to actually make our systems fault tolerant. Um, so because different parts of the system can fail independently, now we have some much trickier scenarios to work through beyond just a stack trace and a transaction rollback. Now we've got to worry about a little gnarlier things. A canonical example here is with partial failure. So in any network communication, we have the possibility that part of the system can fail while other parts continue to work. Um, so if A is calling B and expecting a response back, a calls B and A doesn't get a response within some, some time window, uh, what happened? So we've got this cloud representing this uncertainty in the question marks. But one possibility here is that the request from A never got to B, never arrived there. Or maybe the request got to B and was successfully processed, but the response never got back to A. So how, how in, in the face of this uncertainty, can A make a decision about what it should do? And how, how in general should we deal with this whole class of issues? Not, not just the you know, point to point request response callback, but any number of failure modes that the network boundary introduces. Um, so these aren't cost free mitigations. You know, um, in, in this list, they, they, these are all, all well understood in the industry, leading edge of the industry by and large, but each of us as, as companies and as individuals needs to, needs to learn them in order to, to create fault tolerant systems. Um, but, so so the, these aren't cost free. Doing re retries safely, requires item potency at the remote end. It has to be actually safe to retry. Um, each one of these could be loads of effort. We, you know, we might use libraries to help. Um, we might, you know, as I said, the skill development side, we might need to, to, to ramp up. Um, but in a in microservices world, our applications are really at risk if we're not thinking about these distributed systems problems. We have to watch out here also that if, you know, we think our, our platform team can, can come up with a solution and implement it once as a shared library, if we're using shared libraries to implement these patterns, we may run into a distributed monolith sort of scenario where everybody's got to have the same version of thing, a thing across, across every microservice. And suddenly we've, we're kind of you know, wandering back towards dependency hell. 
that we were trying to avoid in the monolith um, scenario. But we probably do need some sort of shared platform level solution so that not every dev has to re-implement um, the, uh, th these patterns. So things like you know, sidecars, service mesh um, can help here. Um, I, I highly recommend reading Release It by Michael Mygar. The second edition is a fantastic update, worth rereading for those who have read the first edition uh, for more on these kinds of patterns. Okay, so now how do we play with the full system? Well, how do we run through um, run through development as an the, through an application uh, as an end user would? And you sort you know if if you imagine having a whole microservice ecosystem with a web app in front, how do we drive things through as an end user would and ensure it all works together? So in a single process application, this can be super useful, particularly you know if the devs, devs are not super trusting of the test automation. But once we move to a microservices world where a lot more can go wrong and test automation exercising all of these use cases among services is, is a lot harder, um, you know, I, I think it, it's a lot harder to trust the tests in these, in these situations. Um, for teams I've been on, there's for sure less confidence in the tests um, to integrate across functionality as more and more services get involved. And the reality that we've seen really is that with more than any more than a handful, small handful of microservices, you can't just run the whole system end to end locally. You you run out of memory, or you context switch between cr processes, and everything slows to a crawl, or whatever. So we we really have to find new ways to get confident in our software and try things out locally. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of ideas out there in the automated testing landscape, like these ones in Cindy Shudharan's uh, iteration on the testing pyramid. Um, which I'm, I'm really drawn to, um, but it's, it's just harder to gain confidence pre-production in a microservices world, and we, we really need to evolve our thinking on testing um, towards uh, more monitoring and, and, and things like this, and I'll, I'll have some more on this next slide here. Um, but really more connections between components really means we want dev teams to be running more integrated testing, which is, is, is counterintuitive and is sort of... Uh, it, it, it's a thing that makes tests less reliable and harder, uh, but this microservices ecosystem is, is sort of pushing us in this, in this way that creates tension. So again, I, the, the main way I've seen teams build the most confidence in these architectures is by expanding their testing ethos and doing more of this top part, this extensive production testing using techniques like feature flags or canary testing, monitoring, alerting, and thinking about that really under the testing umbrella. This is a really big, scary shift for most teams. Teams who are used to, um, you know, ensuring um, QA departments and everything, uh, de devs on up that, that there are no bugs, no bug gets shipped. Gets shipped. Um, so we have to we have to think about things a little differently if if we go this route. So ultimately, you know, we might be able to run or test a few integrated services. We might be able to poke at them from an API, but running the whole system end to end is probably going to require combining local services with some external environment, uh, which then suddenly means, as I ha have on the slide here, risks uh, test pollution. So developers are going to be stepping on each other's toes. Uh, this last item is, is pretty appealing, orchestrating new isolated infrastructure for each test run. Um, it's certainly appealing. Um, there's a little bit of a, a latency cost. Maybe, maybe that's worthwhile, um, but uh, there's, there's a lot of appealing about that as well. Okay. So observability, I, I think of observability um, as you know essentially how easy it is to gather symptoms and get to root causes of production issues or hopefully prevent issues before they start. So you know, pretty pretty wide definition that, that I roll with. So you know things like monitoring, logging, even SSHing into a host and running strace or perf to see what processes are doing um, on a given you know host um, are, are sort of fall under this umbrella. And observability is a cost. So in a microservices architecture, a bug or an issue isn't restricted to a single edge or node or machine in the system graph. It might require some combination of circumstances in, in a complex system um, to, to coalesce and, and to happen at the, at the same time in production. So there are more things going on. Figuring out what's going on in a system gets more complex even each time you introduce another network hub. It's not just because of the inherent network failure modes with crashes. There's, there's bugs that happen too, and they're, they're just harder to find now. Um, so we can pay down some of these costs to make observability easier. I, I think the, the huge win um, that I've seen in many teams is, is just starting out with log aggregation and correlation IDs or, or backfilling those as soon as possible. Um, fairly low cost, super high impact. 
um, there's 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 other uh, other mechanisms as well. I, I do hope you know that that most folks uh, are are working collaboratively and cross functionally. You know, remember, DevOps is is as much a cultural movement um, as a, as a technical one. It's certainly n not a role, even if your job title is that. DevOps is is the entire team's culture. Um, so I, th I think it's, that's important to remember. And th you know the whole project team for any given service owns that service's reliability. So, you know, working together as teams, getting that operations expertise involved um, with the developers um, and having them, them work together to solve problems is, is critical. But regardless, you know, of, of who's responsible for uptime and solving production issues, whoever is working on this is going to need better tools in a microservices world than they needed in, in a monolithic world. So logging into every host and checking logs isn't a tenable approach, of course. Okay, so this one, tunnel vision, that what I'm calling tunnel vision here is primarily for larger or growing teams adopting microservices. So if, you, if you've got a five-person shop that's thinking about microservices or is currently using one, this may or may not apply. And I don't know really if this one is fundamental to microservices or just really, really common across teams that I've seen and worked with. So, you know, Pushing teams and features towards fine-grained services can mean that teams don't understand how day-to-day -day decisions in their tiny service relate to the larger business priorities. So, you know, with very clear inputs and outputs and API boundaries for each service, it's, it, it is very easy for teams to get focused on the details of their own service development. It's easy to focus on those technical aspects of the work in our specific corner of the system and ignore the bigger picture. So, in, in a sense, this is kind of the point of microservices, right, that a given feature team doesn't have to worry about everything. They can, they can have a little tunnel vision and not have to worry about the entire world. But, you know, as soon as we scope teams down to be less involved with the big picture, it's possible, there is a risk and a cost that those teams may lose the ability to see where innovation or simplification can give the overall actual business huge, huge wins as opposed to the team's service or their handful of services. So, you know, I, I love collective code ownership, but now with small teams owning services, suddenly there are a lot fewer people in that collective. And the system level collective ownership, the overall uh, ownership of, of all of the services, some suddenly becomes really hard. Or maybe not suddenly, but over, over, it, it gets really hard. Um, so I think it's important for us to, to be measuring business metrics and, and not things like, like an individual team's pace of delivery. Um, and having teams focus on those business metrics, which, you know, in, 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 in one sense, you know, is just really smart in general. Why wouldn't we all always want to get on the same page about helping the business succeed? Um, but I, I think it's also, you know, a great way to, to pay for this cost, a great way to, to counteract this, this tunnel vision. But I, I, I unfortunately, I, I think this is fairly rare among development teams that business metrics are, are the way um, that, that we manage um, you know, the, the sort of how we're doing question. So uh, when we move to microservices, we're moving execution and data flow from being explicit to being implicit. So uh, explicit in terms of a function call to a given class that we have, you know, we can use our IDE to navigate to, um, in, uh, to, to actually making an HTTP call or a service bus call. Um, the, the consumer may be in a separate code base than the producer. The information about complexity and coupling used to live inside the code base or inside the configuration files, and now that information is in the network in the network calls. So complexity is moved from the code base to the system, which I, you know, I think is a bit of a scary thing. Um, it's, it's work to understand even much smaller architectures than these Death Star diagrams you see from Amazon, Netflix, um, et cetera. But, and, we, and we really we can't get a lot of mileage out of the single code base static analysis tools that our IDEs and other tools have built in. I think there are some third party ones out there that can help, um, but you know, e even you know, in, 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 by and large, even simple questions like what service has the customer's current shipping address information can be tough to answer in these large ecosystems. And then, you know, once we find out which, which service owns the canonical um, shipping information, how do we make sure that we're calling that service in the way that this service's author is intended? It's not always as easy as just getting a type signature right. Um, it, there can be a lot of complexity hidden behind there that that, that, that service's owner's um, really have, have put some thought into and um, is really encapsulated behind that service boundary. So, you know, we can get some of the benefits of things like type systems by, by using API contracts or specifications. Um, you know, having a great, a really great standardized service discovery story gets really important as ecosystems grow beyond a handful of services and certainly across multiple teams. 
Um, I think that, that that death star diagram I showed earlier um, was created based on runtime information about what calls are actually being made. Um, so it, it's not free, um, but but that 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 and because that implies you know some sort of log um, log management and um, some of the some of the observability stuff we saw earlier. Uh, but there's probably some open source software out there um, that we could pull in. But again, like the tooling exists, and and we can learn and figure out how to mitigate these things, again, that doesn't make it free. That's it, If you hear somebody say, oh, we'll just use, you know, such and such API contract, that you're already, or if you find yourself saying that, you're already sort of like downplaying what the cost is and perhaps underestimating it. Okay, uh, this is another one that I'm not sure if it's inherent or just really common, and it's, it's about multi-team microservices efforts. So, of course, there are teams that have conflict all the time in monoliths, um, stopping on each other's code, et cetera. What's the difference here? So I'm specifically talking here about work that people agree needs to get done. It's just a question of priority. So, you know, when a service dependency has almost all the functionality our team needs, but then that service is owned by another team, we need them to make the change. So how do we make our change that we want one of their top priorities to address? Our service is their service's customer, it's, you know, we're their reason for being, we're consuming their service. So we definitely expect to have some way to request changes from that team. They've probably got a lot of other stakeholders as well. We're not, um, we're not their only customers. They have their backlog of priorities. They probably got um, maybe, maybe many other teams um, asking for things. So we can't, you know, just impose our will directly on this service. Instead, we need to find some way to collaborate with them to get that change made. And collaboration can be hard, let's face it, across service boundaries. Um, so we can pay for this. We can we can improve this, the story, the cultural story, um, both in terms of business value um, and whatever that team values. Um, we, we can make our pitch. Um, or organizationally, we could take steps to speed up development on that service, right? To to widen that bottleneck, um, to clear out the things that are in front of us in the queue. Um, we could we could use a sort of internal open source idea, um, but but which I'm actually I'm pretty drawn to. Um, but managing those contributions is still going to take some time on the on the part of the the, the, the team that owns the service. There's no free lunch here. Um, and and the rebuild idea, I've seen this a number of times where our team may just rebuild a similar service to what they need. And there's duplicated effort as an additional cost that gets raised here. Of course, um, it may be worth it depending on how long the queues are, etc. Um, but then you know once we rebuild something, if we build something that's similar but not quite the same. Um, we pretty qu quickly feed back into a different view of that consistency issue from earlier. We were talking about data before and being consistent across multiple services, and this is now about code or semantics, um, where we have similar but, but slightly out of sync uh, semantics across multiple services. Um, there's you know, fairly common microservices wisdom that duplication is of this type is okay and it's natural as systems grow, which which you know I, I can sympathize with. Uh, but there's still an, a non-zero cost here, right? It might be cheap if we just copy paste the service, tweak a line, and redeploy. But now service discoverability gets harder. Which one has the canonical data now, et cetera? There are a lot of things to consider here. So uh, services are hard to change across boundaries, right? Boundaries, the, the point of a boundary is it, it doesn't shift so that so that you can change the stuff behind it. Um, and therefore, it's hard to change across boundaries, um, and, and especially as the number of consumers grows. So maybe we want to add a new required field in an API, or maybe we want to rename a field in the response, or maybe we want to delete an endpoint altogether. Or maybe you know we just realized that three services are tending to require changes for the same reasons, and we want to kind of re-inline those into, into a, uh, a single service instead of three. So, you know, changing our minds about what happens at those boundaries requires coordination across teams, um, by and large. So, n not to mention, you know, the purely technical bits here, right? There's no find callers, IDE function, um, or inline microservice, or, or move microservice um, refactoring. Unfortunately, may maybe this will exist in 20 years um, as, as, as tooling develops, handle these things. But I, I think there are aspects of it that are fundamentally hard. Um, because we're, we're, you know, again, we're using different technologies. Yeah, I, I might write my service in Java, and you might write yours in Go, um, et cetera. Um, and you know, beyond the mechanics of making changes at the seams, um, we risk breaking service consumers without knowing it. Remember, you know, we're deploying independently here, so that's that's one of our core benefits. So our, our consumers might only know about our, the version of our service from one 
version behind, three, ten versions behind where, where the most, uh, the latest and greatest is. Um, so, uh, you know, we can't, um, we can't rely on people updating ex at exactly the same time. Design mistakes are relatively cheap within our code bases, right, on a single team, but at the seams, design mistakes are really hard to fix. So certainly, you know, being really deliberate and careful about which services to extract, about what the API looks like, that can help. Um, even, even once we decide, though, on a microservice extraction, um, if we do keep the initial service extraction with the same team as the original service, um, until that service proves its independence and gets its API fleshed out and, and proven, um, you know, this can limit the risk um, before moving it on to a different team and having a, having a different team uh, manage that. Um, you, versioning is a, is a controversial one. There are some folks out there who consider uh, API versioning to be an anti-pattern, and some consider it essential. So, uh, you know, do, do some research. Think about think about what the what the what the impacts are going to be, um, and, and what the possible um, uh, good things are going to be. Uh, as you can see here, there's there's two pages of mitigations because I, I honestly I, I don't think we've agreed as an industry on great answers here. It's hard work to change across boundaries, and so I I, I think. Um, even even don't make breaking changes, right? This is this is this is controversial as well. I think I think there's it'd be great if we could do that, um, and in many cases we can. So it it might be that these costs are worth it to your team and to your organizations, but they do exist, and I think we we as an industry as software developers we should acknowledge that. So what choices do we have? What are our alternatives? How else can we get? The benefits we're looking for with microservices. Um, one, one possibility is we can still do services. We can just make them more coarse grained and get, you know, really decoupled between services, but without going full force into the, the micro uh, part of, of microservices, really tiny ones. We might not get as many of the benefits as we want, right? We might end up with three three <laughs> mini monoliths or three full size monoliths as our our team grows. Um, but if we can pay fewer costs, it might still end up being a net win. Right, so there, there's a balance here. Alter uh, incidentally, I, I have a website, sendyservices.com. It's kind of a troll page. Um, uh, it's supposed to be 10,000 times better than microservices just because of the, the, the uh, metric system, Senti, and, and micro. It's silly. Uh, sorry. Uh, but uh, alternatively, you know, to get some of the independent team boundary legacy code removal benefits, we can use modules encapsulation within the same process, maybe even the same language. Not necessarily, though, if you think about uh, the JVM and the languages that are supported there, even on the Erlang VM and, and others. Um, I mean, f first, one possibility is we, 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 you know, we, we can grow pretty big and successful within the monolith. Uh, there's a company called Basecamp that has 100,000 companies running project management on it. Um, plenty of other companies um, have gotten a really long way. This is a, an excerpt from... David Heinemeyer Hansen's uh, famous blog post, the majestic monolith on, on their, their architecture and uh, what they've enjoyed about it. Uh, Dan Mangus, the founding CTO at Braintree, now at Root Insurance, describes this great practical approach to using encapsulation within a monolith ecosystem with clear module boundaries and even static analysis to really support the decoupling they're looking for and ensuring that teams don't reach across boundaries in ways that they're not supposed to. So their goal in, in building in this way is to be ready to migrate to microservices in the future if and when they're ready to pay for these costs that we've been talking about. And finally, you know, on encapsulation within a code base, Michael Feathers wrote this really interesting thought piece asking, you know, whether maybe we as developers or software development organizations might not actually have the discipline to encapsulate within a code base and language. And incidentally, that, that's one of the reasons I'm drawn to, to Dan's approach of using static analysis to provide that discipline. But I think, you know, as usual for Michael, this is, this is really insightful um, that, that this discipline um, can be lacking and totally fair. And I, I think, though, that we should also ask ourselves if, if, we, if, if we're um, drawn to this route and saying, okay, we need to pull things apart into different services to create that discipline, um, if we don't have the discipline to build decoupled architecture in a single process, where are we going to get the discipline that's required to pay down these costs and to manage this much, much, much more complex system? Okay, so, you know, we all as software developers have software to build, decisions to make, so how do I think we should move forward? So first, I, you know, for every problem we want to solve, like take for example, I want teams to be able to work more independently. I think it's important for us to come up with multiple solutions and enumerate the benefits and the costs in good faith, right? Like 
for the costs, what what are the mitigations we can put in place? This process can be refer recursive. So you know, what are the costs of the mitigations itself, and and what what are the implications there? I I don't have any illusions that this is controversial advice. You know, thinking about problems and solutions and pros and cons. But I think you know, as, as many of us as would, would would look at this slide and say, yeah, of course, we should we should work in this way. I think this is what I've observed is it's extremely rare in our field for us to actually talk about the circumstances under which our choice is the right one and the circumstances under which our choice is the wrong one. And I think moving into a world where we're actually being that honest with ourselves and with our colleagues um, is, is, is a really healthy um, mindset shift to make. So, you know, hype is great. I really like uh, industry hype because it tells me about things that I should be investigating. I, I want to hear about places where people are getting big wins um, out on the leading edge. I want to acknowledge those wins that people are describing, but you know I don't want to believe the hype. I don't want to automatically believe that. I want to understand that most of us are not Google, are not Netflix or Amazon. So that hype could absolutely indicate some huge benefits for your organization, but don't take it at face value. Think, think the problems through and the solutions. And as developers and technical people in general, we, you know, we need to think about what costs we're requiring of our employers and of our colleagues. So what fraction of our development time do we need to spend paying these costs? Right? There because there, you know, it might not be exactly the same number of hours or a fraction every week, but you know, whatever fraction of our development time, you multiply that by our salaries, that there there is a cost and there is a real monetary value here um, that that um, that is needing to be paid. So who's on pager duty um, as well? How many additional operations or distributed systems experts does our company need to hire? And you know, what if we cut the seams wrong and have rework to do? What if we need to re-inline services as we as we learn new things, as we experiment? So this one I think is really hard for teams to recognize sometimes in the midst of all the cool technology. I think it's important that we make sure we're really getting the benefits. If we find ourselves testing and deploying all our services together, boom, we just lost the independent deployability benefit. If we assume that every service call succeeds, uh, you know, we lost a benefit, we lost this fault tolerance benefit, and we you know, forget, forgot to pay the cost of, of, of needing uh, fault tolerance. Right? Um, so you know, my, my typical approach and, and, and what I'll recommend is you know, when you've got an existing code base and that code base is a mess, which is very often the thing that makes us want microservices in the first place, extracting is hard work. You know, I find in many cases that when we refactor inside the code base towards services, so for instance, using Martin Fowler's service layer pattern, um, refactor towards that, and um, with the idea that we can then sprout a microservice, create a, a microservice in, in a manner similar to Michael Feather's legacy code uh, sprout class um, uh, mechanism. Often, when we refactor in code base, we might find that once the required decoupling exists, to, to actually make the split, the network boundary introducing that suddenly looks less appealing for many, many teams. You know, remember, there are lots of costs to pay here as soon as we introduce that network boundary. Okay, so in closing, I've, I've got some resources to share. I'll urge you to read these books with a close eye to the costs before lobbying to adopt microservices. And if, if you're already in this world um, and it's, it's sort of too late to, to do it beforehand, that's fine, do, you know, do, do it now and definitely, definitely t give these books a look. Um, these books are a little older, but the lessons absolutely apply, whether you stick with a monolith or you start extracting services. Um, you know, to, to the best of my ability, I, I really want to be knowledgeable and honest about the costs or the downsides of my architecture proposals. And it's important for me that I'm and my teams aren't being dismissive or hand-waving about how we're going to pay for these costs. You know, estimation, of course, is really hard. Being wrong is going to happen. I'm not trying to say here that you need to provide written estimates to the hour or month, whatever, um, of, of what these costs are. And I don't want to get into a whole like no estimates argument. Um, but you know, microservices are not cost free. They're not pure win. And it really it takes a lot of learning and a lot of hard work to run them smoothly. So let's be sure that when we talk about microservices, we're being very clear about the many, many costs if we're advocating for these in our organizations. So thank you for joining me today, and thanks to Centers for having me. I'd, I'd love to talk more, either you know, at Q and A here afterwards, or on Twitter, um, TRPT Colin on Twitter. Uh, you know, whether it's about this topic directly or how we do consulting and software delivery at Flight. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Mason from Centers
Sure. Uh, Colin, thanks Thanks again for uh, uh, such an informative brief. Uh, what we'll do now is we're, we're going to turn it over uh, to uh, field a few questions from our audience uh, here in a few minutes. Uh, but while, while the audience members are, are typing up their questions, I'll talk just briefly about CenterZip. Uh, CenterZip is uh, a uh, outsourced software development. You're, they're your agile uh, software development partner. Um, we have uh, approximately 500 developers in Pune, India, and we look to accelerate the delivery of your product roadmap. Uh, we can address any kind of uh, technological uh, skill set gaps uh, from the people we have on board, and uh, we look to save uh, costs uh, uh, for our customers. Uh, so look to augment your team with, with – uh, we can also augment your team with on-site professionals. Um, and here is just a, a small uh, a sample of our, 100, our 150 clients over the last uh, 15 years of uh, doing business. Uh, please connect with uh, CenterZip uh, at Twitter at, at CenterZip or on LinkedIn or, or on Facebook. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll look. Uh, yes, our next uh, webinar is uh, Scaling Agile Organically. That's going to be held on Tuesday, September 18th at noon central time, presented by Damon Poole. He's an Agile co coach and author. All right, so uh, just uh, taking a few questions from our audience. This is um, from Alan. Uh, what is your estimate of percent of groups that implement microservices that get next to no or next to no benefit? Um, and what, how would you say that relates to group size? That's, that's, that's a really good. Yeah, that's a really good question, Alan. So the percent of the groups that um, they get <laughs> no benefits or next to no benefits. This is a really hard one. I, I actually I, I'm going to have to to lead with the fact that I I can't be I can't claim to speak for the industry here. There is definitely selection bias at at play, right? I I work at a consulting shop where people are having to come ask us. For uh, for help with these sorts of things, um, sometimes that help comes as the decisions being made. You know, what should we do? How should we proceed? But often that help comes in in the form of, hey, we've got this problem. Um, we need help fixing it, right? And and so by that point, um, we can already um, we can already assume that, that they're not getting very many benefits. I have to say that. Um, most of the teams that we work with are getting at least some benefits out of microservices. Um, primarily, you know, the, the benefits that, that these teams are shooting for um, on the legacy code side, on the, you know, improve, improving the, the local code base story, primarily, in, in, in my observation, these are, these are being realized, right? The, the code bases are smaller. Um, however, because of the complexity shift, you know, from the code to the system, um, I, you know, it, it's it, it's hard to talk about numerically, but um, I, I would tend to argue that more often than not, uh, the the overall complexity has grown, and and um, uh, often often the the benefits are not realized um, in in these other areas. Um, I I think so. So I, I I would even have to say, even even given my sort of selection biased position here. Um, most teams are are getting some of the benefits, so I I, I would say, you know, approaching zero percent, maybe five percent or something, we're getting no benefits um, from from moving to microservices. However, um, you know, once you start factoring in, you know, what what costs they had to pay to get to where they went, um, you know, how many months they had to spend pulling pulling this service out while it was already running, or how much time they had to devote to operational introspection efforts. Um, I, I would say, very, very often, are, are uh, I, I would I, I think I think it's upside down. Um, for again, in my biased position of of people who are coming to us for help. Now that said, there are many teams um, who are who are having to pay some pretty high costs, but for whom their business initiatives just would not work um, with the large development teams that they have um, in, in any but the most you know, extremely disciplined static analysis, boundary creating um, situations. Um, so, you know, 
once you've got hundreds, thousands of developers involved, having a single code base and, and deploying independently gets really, really hard, and, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have recommended um, those folks to, to sort of re-inline the thing uh, and, sh and shift gears. Of course, re-inlining <laughs> will have its own costs. Um, so I, I know that's a, a bit of a non-answer there, but I would, I, I would say close to zero um, are getting no benefits. Um, it's hard for me to speculate on those for whom it was, it was a bad decision because there are so many variables in play. I think most, though, of, of the teams that I've worked with and seen out in the wild um, are you know, getting maybe less than half of, of the benefits that we talked about. Gotcha. All right. Uh, another question here. This is uh, from Subu. He he asks, can we use an agile approach approach uh, to implement microservices? And would each microservice team unit you, uh, be usually be a separate sprint team? Great question. Okay, so yes, I I, I definitely like I, I would strongly advocate for um, you know uh, an incremental approach, especially in situations where you've got a monolith that you're looking to move away from, right? So, so the approach that I described in the, the alternative section um, in, in terms of, of extracting towards a service, towards microservices, so start, starting by, by not saying um, we're going to create a brand new service from scratch and you know, create the same, but rather by saying we're going to refactor such that there's a you know a well-defined small number of entry points to this bit of code over here, and we'll we'll um, we'll isolate that code first, and then we'll do the extraction of of that code into a, a single a, a separately independently um, developed and, and maintained and operationalized uh, service. So yes, I I, I would I, I you know in most circumstances. That's that's what I'm going to lobby for as as my my base case. Now there, there there's all kinds of reasons why that's not always um, um, possible or, or even even a good idea. It might be that that um, the legacy code base has, has gotten so old that that nobody knows how it works and there's no unit test, etc. Um, or or it's so gnarly. Um, usually there's legacy code techniques to get around those kinds of things. But um, I, I I think. Uh, yeah, so, so so that's that's to say that sort of situation um, uh, could could be uh, a, a reason to sort of start greenfield on the new app. But certainly you can you can you can work in an agile incremental fashion with with greenfield apps, you know, as easily as you can um, with with existing code bases. Um, the, the other trade off there, if you're refactoring towards it, is that maybe you're doing this refactoring effort. Um, um, which which will definitely still be usable usable and used on the client side on the consumer side of the main app if if it's if you assume it's calling out um, but you know if you rewrite into a different language um, if that language you know might might fly out the door as soon as you uh, deploy um, so I, I I do think um, what what I've seen in the industry in terms of your your second part of that question in terms of you know which teams, which sprint teams might own uh, a given service. Um, what I've seen most often is that um, a team will own a small handful of services. Um, I've, I've seen teams that that uh, have kind of a one person per service uh, sort of rule, uh, which you know depending on how small and the service is and how much operational effort uh, it is, then, then that that can work. Uh, but there's also you know you don't want to have the the sort of uh, 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 silo knowledge silo bus factor if somebody leaves the company that service no longer can be maintained uh, that sort of thing doesn't make any sense so I, I, I like the collective ownership idea and I like um, I like teams to be um, to yeah usually a, a team would own a small handful of services and and really like have that ownership and be able to make those uh, decisions both about the services development um, about uh, ensuring ensuring its um, it's achieving its, its 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 objectives in terms of performance and security and and business goals and all, all those good things. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, typically a, a a given service would fall under one team's purview. Whether that team's multi managing one service or six or ten services, um, you know, it depends on how big the services are and depends on the number, of, you know, how how dependent on the services, etc. Um, but cer certainly, I, I I would want a service. A, a single team to be able to make the decisions around that service that, that affect um, affect that service's internals. 
And one question just for myself is, I'm, I'm curious, I, you know, I see containers as sort of an enabling uh, technology uh, for microservices, um, but also uh, what's kind of surging as popularity are like serverless technologies like uh, AWS's Lambda. I'm interested in what you feel like um, the interaction will be with serverless technologies and microservices like if uh, one will be favored over the other or they'll work in sort of a complementary fashion whatnot. Yeah, great question. So yeah, I, there's every time I talk to somebody about serverless, it's it's I, I talk about exactly these kinds of costs because I, I see serverless as almost kind of a subset of microservices. Um, you know, with 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 the serverless architecture, you've got you know a I'm single. Sorry? Oh, did I did I break up? Um, so I, yeah, I, I think about yeah, serverless. you broke up for a minute. I want to start again. Okay, I, I think about serverless as being a subset of, of microservices. So when I talk to people about serverless, I'm always talking about these same sorts of costs, um, especially, you know, certainly the functions as a service uh, angle of serverless. Um, so Lambda or Google Google Cloud um, or, or Azure functions. Um, I, you know, a given microservice may be composed of, of multiple API endpoints. Um, in a similar way to um, to how uh, you might compose multiple serverless functions to do a similar you know area of work, um, but yeah, I, I, there are a lot of benefits to, to serverless, both in terms of cost management and you know the metered and, and auto scaling sort of behavior that I talked about earlier. Um, most of the serverless providers are getting a lot better at um, at allowing more and more languages. One of the one of the historical uh, uh, blockers to serverless adoption has been um, the idea that oh they don't they don't support my my language runtime yet and that it's, that's becoming less and less the case across providers as they add more languages and and runtimes but with with microservices you you know with with, with the you know the broader uh, Venn diagram circle of microservices you have potential for a lot more deployment options right you may have a service that that runs continuously um, uh, does batch processing. Uh, any number of things that that aren't historically typically a great fit for the more reactive um, single purpose you know sort of five minute time limit um, uh, uh, ser serverless technology so yeah I, I do see it as, as sort of a subset in which you know all of the constraints um, typically apply to a greater or lesser extent um, uh, from from microservices um, but which which also has its own sort of set of, of benefits and challenges um, within that um, but yeah, th there's there's a lot to like uh, about serverless and and containers as well. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's all uh, the question. Oh wait, we got one more. Okay. Ooh, uh, one last question. This is this is from Florence. Uh, how would a large company start a microservice overhaul of the monolithic programs that they have? Like, what would be a good sort of a planning strategy for for microservices? Yeah. So how would a large company overhaul a large monolith? So I think, I think it's important to start, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, with, with what are the benefits? What are, what are the reasons uh, we're looking to move in this direction? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, independent deployability and these big overhaul uh, enterprise um, transformations are great, right? They're great. You know, it's great when people sort of, um, are able to recognize um, the challenges that a technology organization is facing and to, to really from the top down invest in those. However, at the same time, I think, it's, I think it's important to look at the benefits and in terms of prioritization, right, where, where are we feeling the most pain, right, which, where, where is the most tension between um, teams, where are teams trying to uh, what, what are the most depended on sort of bits of the code base? What are the pieces that would be the easiest to, to, to pull out? I, I, I like to think, you know, in, in the long term about the first question, the gnarliest pieces, the pieces that people are colliding on and, and, and teams are jockeying for position and, and, and uh, maybe breaking changes happen often in this particular area of the code base. But those are often the hardest to start with and the hardest to learn these operational lessons about microservices. So my usual approach is, is to do something counterintuitive and not necessarily start with the parts that are causing the most pain, but start with the parts that are going to be the easiest to extract so that we can learn those operational 
lessons in in a place um, uh, that's that's sort of less less contended. Um, so perhaps that that might be something um, some some new service that's going to spin up um, and and uh, to which the, the monolith could call into or it could call in to the monolith in some way. Um, but pulling those things out. Um, around the edges of the ecosystem, I think is, is a great way to, to get those early initial wins and those learnings and that experimentation um, to, 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 to in, in a way that's not going to break the business, right? In a way that's not going to not going to cause pain for 1,500 developers, but it's that's going to be handled um, by one team and by some some little dependent on feature um, where that experimentation is is you know more or less safe to do or at least safer than, than in other places. Hope that helps. Well, Colin, I really want to thank you for your time uh, today and, and uh, feeling all our questions. Uh, really, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, thanks again. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, thanks to all of you uh, who, for sticking around.